Hi there, I'm Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez, and this is the Design Your Physician Life podcast. Welcome to this episode brought to you by our Max Mastermind, which is an exclusive mastermind for physician entrepreneurs, or how I'd like to say, it's a professional and personal development program for physicians who want to learn entrepreneurship. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Brett Levine from Boom, breaking out of the medical mindset. We have a great conversation with Dr. Levine. Guess what about? Yes, breaking out of that medical mindset. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Design Your Physician Life podcast, where you will get excited about being a physician, learn the tools that can help boost your success, and great tips from successful doctors. Join us to unlock the keys to an amazing physician life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez. Hey guys, we're extremely excited today. We have Dr. Brett Levine. He has been an ear, nose, and throat surgeon for 27 years, and he's the CEO of the Beach Cities ENTs just outside LA in California. Over several decades, he faced many obstacles and challenges to remain happy and healthy in medicine today. The pivotal epiphany he discovered was that the habits and strategies which helped him excel to become a physician were also what kept him stuck stagnant and frustrated in life. Through risks and failures, he discovered strategies that were the opposite of what he knew, but which helped him thrive. He writes a free newsletter for breaking out of medical mindset, a platform that delivers breakthrough concepts and strategies to healthcare professionals to break free from suffocation, depletion, and burnout, and to expand their options, empowerment, and freedom. He also offers a course to teach the concepts and strategies. He offers tools and resources for success, freedom, and happiness. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Levine. Thank you so much, Mirdalis. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, so we were talking early on, you know, like um, in medicine, we have lost a lot of our, you know, we have given away the things that physicians used to do for, for the sake of, you know, good things, just to take care of our patients. And that's been uh, you know, a great thing. But at the same time, unfortunately, we gave away um, a lot of the leadership, a lot of the decision making. And um, we really are never taught uh, leadership skills, even though we say, oh, you're the leader of the team immediately or communication skills. And we get all to those things. But these changes that you had in your life didn't come without the need to change. Let's talk about first your early years, right? Where in, before, who was the one who decided to be a doctor? Was it like young boy bread or teen bread? Who was that who decided, oh, I want someday I want to be a doctor and then I, an ENT? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, a little bit of my background. I was born in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my dad was a entrepreneur businessman who just did what it took to make money. Both my parents didn't come from much. And my mom had a dream and my parents' marriage was set up so that my mom dreamed and my dad funded her dreams, essentially. And uh, uh, my childhood was really very stable and blessed. And Were they good dreams your mom, your mom had? My mom dreamed of travel. My mom dreamed of having a nice house and having parties at her home. And that was the childhood I broke. I, I was raised in. It was beautiful. A lot of things I've tried to carry with my own family. Uh, and then one day out of the blue to disrupt my harmony, uh, my parents decided they wanted to leave the cold and the snow. And when I was 14, they chose to move to Florida, which for me was in the middle of high school and was my first big pivot disruption and discomfort. Uh, that was really very challenging. And I took refuge in something I was good at, which was being a student and learning. And that saved me. And I did very well in school and only knew that I didn't want to stay in Florida. I didn't want to stay in humidity. And come on, it's not I'll, that bad. Come on, come on. <laughs> it's great for vacation, but I don't know for a suit and tie. Uh, and I just set that move, that change allowed me to look anywhere else in the United States to live. And I found USC in Los Angeles and got accepted and came there as a, as a pre-med, as, as someone who enjoyed helping people. So I knew that was one of the 
one of my goals personally in life. And Did you have any mentors, who, anybody you looked up and said, oh, when I grow up, I want to. No, I really didn't have like a, I didn't have a role so. model. No. Uh, there were characteristics of medicine that attracted me. Number one, it was very known. I knew the steps, the goals, and the achievements to get from one step to another to the end point. And the person I was at that time needed all of that control and knowing. So that was very attractive. It allowed me to be independent and achieve it on my own, separate from my father's success. So that was another goal. And it had a purpose. And it was more than just setting a goal to make, a mo to make money, become a millionaire or billionaire, but have some personal fulfillment, which I needed. With all that, I became a pre-med and still exposed myself to some business classes and computer classes. And I took French and Spanish and things I loved and never found anything that swayed me and stayed pre-med and did the course and had my certainty, my control and uh, got accepted into medical school where I continued my laser focus without distraction and learn that yes is the answer and you never say no and you can't have vulnerability and we need to be perfect because these are parts of the medical mindset that allow us to succeed during our training. I matched at the University of Pennsylvania and went there for internship and residency and continued along this course of giving people what they want, striving for perfection, avoiding all risk, controlling everything, doing everything alone and on my own as the expert, needing no one. This is the medical mindset that really got me very far as hardworking, disciplined, smart, focused, driven as all people who make it this far get to be. And then when it came time to look for jobs uh, and wanting to stay in Southern California, I hit a, a roadblock that I just could not find something that felt right and matched with my needs, my needs for a guaranteed salary, my needs for trusting and respecting people I would be joining, my need for seeing overflow Is that I could grow salary from. and need or a want. Well, what would your father say? At that time, it was both, right? I wanted it, but I needed it. I wasn't comfortable doing anything different and ended up taking a job, ended up relinquishing that need and want when I couldn't find what I thought would match with me and looking elsewhere and letting go of that dream and looking in Vegas and Texas and Florida and Washington, D.C., and taking a job in New Jersey and working harder. Uh, Why did you like ENT? What attracted you from ENT? Uh, I, I, I see it as choices at forks in the road. So one fork was, do I want to work with patients or not? Do I want to be a radiologist, a pathologist, someone that isn't really in direct, constant patient contact? And I definitely had to be with people. So that removed those specialties. I was attracted to surgery because I am someone who likes immediate gratification and quick change, very different from psychiatry, internal medicine, managing diabetes and other th problems that are more challenging. So that sort of narrowed me into surgery. And then... Um, you look at the lifestyle, the personalities, the patient population you deal with. And for me, of all the body parts, I would prefer the face. So that brought me to ENT. We don't have that many emergencies. It's a pretty good lifestyle. Um, and in addition, uh, not many people die. Even our cancer patients, I would say 95 to 98% of them are curable and survive. I, it would be hard for me to be in a profession where uh, there was a lot of injury and a lot of not as fulfilling, dramatic change and success. But all of those things pushed me into ENT, of which I loved the fact that we deal with children to the elderly, the fact that we deal with problems that can be microscopically dealt with, endoscopically dealt with, or more large surgeries. Um the fact that we help people hear better, breathe better, smell better, uh, swallow better, speak better, just a lot of a lot of satisfaction, gratification, a lot of appreciation from our patients. It's really very enjoyable, especially. So uh, I, I at the end of training, I ended up taking a job outside of New Jersey with a great guy who was very ethical and honest and overwhelmed. And it's a perfect opportunity. But I really just didn't want to live there. 
and I wasn't happy. And I spent my time focusing on my career, trying to grow a life, which we finally get to do and have this need of speed uh, when we get out of training to catch up and get married, have kids, buy a house all in a year or two from that everyone else did in their 20s and 30s. And uh, one day, a year and a half in, uh, as I was trying to make the best of a difficult situation, well, actually, I should start with the fact that during that challenge, during that time where I was not as aligned as when I first came to SC and knew I wanted to be in Southern California, I started uh, exploring more of myself and joined a school called the New York School of Practical Philosophy, where you sort of learn baby steps towards meditation. And I began the first time in my life at 35 hearing other people share vulnerability and challenges and began doing that myself in a safe space and began learning how to quiet my mind and began learning how to grow and heal in a way that was outside of Western medicine. And it really is something I've carried to this day and grown. Uh, and on top of that, I wrote a book called How to Join by Our Merger Physicians Practice, sharing all that I had learned in that process of getting a job. And one day, really randomly, one of my friends in fellow in residency at Penn called to tell me that a guy one year older than me at 30 something had just collapsed in his office and his brother, who was his partner, tried to resuscitate him and he died. Uh, he had a wife who was an ER nurse that we all knew in residency and took care of us. He had a one-year-old son. And although I wasn't close with this guy, uh, it gives me chills every time I tell the story because it really slapped me in my soul of what am I doing here if this is not the life you want to lead. And I immediately just started answering all ads in Southern California, took a job that guaranteed me a salary without much vetting, and gave notice and felt free again as if I was back on track with my life and drove across the country with one of my fraternity brothers and all my possessions to this job that I now had in Southern California um, and was back in where I wanted to live with my friends, with the lifestyle I wanted and found a job that wasn't as good as the job I had. And the guy had no overflow. He had no patience. He didn't have the best reputation in town. and. I sat in an office seeing one or two patients a day, um, wondering what I was going to do with my life now at the pinnacle of where I should have been starting my dream. So I, I marketed myself the old fashioned way. I joined the Rotary Club and gave talks and uh, said yes to anything possible. I literally went door to door to every primary care physician and pediatrician in the community and introduced myself personally. And uh, slowly started getting some patience, but it really was very slow. I needed something to fill my time, even though I was paid and got a salary. So I started taking classes at UCLA in writing and started dreaming about what I would do in my next life after medicine, even though I had never really begun a life in medicine. And about six months, well, five, four to six months in, I started asking around town for other opportunities. I could see this wasn't going to last. I wasn't guaranteed a salary forever. And uh, I went away for a three-day weekend in Florida for my sister's wedding and came back and found a letter on my desk asking me to vacate the premises immediately. I was terminated. He had heard that I was speaking to other people. He felt I was ruining his reputation, which wasn't very good in the first place. And uh, he ended my contract and dismissed me. And for the first time at 35, I had no plan. And this is someone who had a plan from 17, did all the things to be pre-med, got into med school, med school, residency, residency fellowship, and job. And uh, again, another really crisis pain point that uh, didn't know what to do. And I packed up everything I owned, all my certificates, all my books, and drove home in a daze of unknowing. And I was fortunate that I had some different relationships, some referring docs, my consultant who wrote the book with me, who just called me. And in this daze, they just told me what to do. Get a beeper, get a new phone number, tell your referring docs, you're no longer in that practice. 
And one of the guys in the community called me, who I didn't know, and said we should get together. It turned out he was just five doors down on the same street in the same city of where I live. You didn't have a non-compete? I, in California, non-competes aren't really enforceable. I, I didn't have a non-compete that was enforceable. It didn't really matter. So he called me and said, I have an office that I'm only in part-time. You are welcome to see patients there and use the equipment and the facilities. And when you get on your feet, pay me back. And that was the beginning of me starting my own private practice. And I eventually did the, a similar situation in two other offices and was running on the freeways between clinics, between Cedars in LA to Los Alamitos to Torrance in the South Bay and growing three different locations uh, in three different hospital communities at the best I could getting busier and busier. And for 10 years, that was my life. And over that time, I got married. I had three kids. Uh, I got busier in all the offices. I was running from one office to the other, taking emergencies, finishing the day, going back to a hospital. And, you know, I got what I wished for. I was very busy in very offices, in various offices, working harder, trying to get busier and earn more money and really hit a ceiling that I became trapped by who I had become and all of the tenants I had told myself. I, had the, I realized I had a certain amount of hours in a day. That's all I could do. And I would go to different accountants and ask, how can I decrease my taxes and take home more money? And they would just say, work harder and make more money. So I would find another accountant and did that over and over again. And uh, work in medicine had just become a tidal wave of three little kids, a wife, you know, many offices, staff, I just not could not do any more. And I got frustrated and stuck and felt limited. And I realized that uh, no one was going to save me and I needed to do something different. And about that time, uh, one of my buddies uh, had said, you know, I think I want to start a group. And I had just been reading a book called Success Principles by Jack Canfield about mastermind groups. And he said, you know, I've got a few friends and I had a few friends. Let's get together once a month and just support each other and share. And this was um, this was an extension of what I had done in the philosophy group. And we began meeting once a month. Uh, all of us were guys who had our own businesses, who had two or three kids and sharing our challenges, whether with our kids, with our wives, with our businesses or just with our happiness and did that for a few years. It was really pivotal. It helped me close that office that I spent 10 years to build to focus my, my efforts. It helped me uh, learn different ways of disciplining my kids without yelling, or uh, it helped me communicate better in marriage. It really just helped me share, which doctors don't do. It helped me be vulnerable, which doctors don't do. And during, after a while, it got a little stale. It felt like I would kept wanting to grow and people were saying the same thing. And someone from one of the people in our group came in and said, I'm starting a mastermind group. These are our pillars and tenants. Uh, and it really seemed uncomfortable, but in an exciting way. So I joined this group called Go Abundance. I was one doctor amongst about 50 realtors, mortgage brokers, and insurance brokers. And really was very outside the box, but in an exciting way. I met in the first conference, a guy named Robert Kiyosaki and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then Tom Wheelwright, and then understood passive income and understood what leverage was and just saw these people who worked less hard than me, made more money than me, and had more freedom than me. And it was the first time I really understood the concept that we don't know what we don't know. We are experts on otitis media, thyroid tumors, slurring and sleep apnea, and keep up on all those things. But there is a world out there of people who just live life at a happier level and just take advantage of skills that we are unaware of, or at least I was unaware of. And this became the beginning of more transformation to me. And I began leading the group in LA and learning from the people that became my friends uh, outside of medicine, completely separate from uh, everything I did in medicine. And I found that 
the things they would do were the opposite of what had worked so well in medicine for me. And I became comfortable doing things in medicine one way with patients and doing things in my life a different way. And I didn't know it at the time, but over 10 years, that became the premise of breaking out of the medical mindset because so many of these concepts saved me and allowed me to love medicine and still love my life. So I, I'll stop there because that was a lot. Well, but, that, was, uh, that was a lot, but it's actually the lives of so many of us, you know, uh, you've said it, you've said it very clearly, like I can identify, you know, um, just being focused on becoming a physician, going through life like that, going through the, through the, you know, the, the parts that you have to do, the moves and, uh, I'm becoming a physician, getting the life, getting the house, getting the family and just, you know, fighting for that, maybe changing from one job to the other, because you didn't like how they were treated in your case, you were let go. Uh, but it's not not different than what many of us live and what we don't know because you you have to become to become a physician, you have to learn so much. There's no space really made into our our um, learning system to learn about these other things, which I think to some extent, you know, people are learning now these days, uh, these things with, with having so much access earlier than what any of us did in the past. I know you're talking about pagers right now. And then, you know, the younger generation is going to say, what, what's a pager, right? But we had pagers and, and uh, we communicate in very different ways. And still to this day, I think that the um, learning system is not teaching us how to communicate in those ways fully, because we have to learn medicine after all, right? Like it's life or death um, to, you know, it's what we do. Um, and just learning about these whole concepts of not working well, passive income, not having to be there, <laughs> you know, it's the opposite of medicine. We have to be there to make money for most of us, right? We have to be present and that's, that's not what you need. So let's, let's try to divide the concepts, you know, like you say that the medicine mindset, and mindset is something that you started working on early on after you left medicine, but still it took you time because then you were focused still on developing this medicine career. Um, let's talk about what those two breaths were, right? During that period of time in the, those 10 years that you were like, okay, I'm in medicine like this. This is my mindset. This is what I am, which helps you being successful in medicine, take good care of your patients and make sure that nobody dies, even that less than 10% of the cancer patients. And, um, and the other mindset that helps you maybe even present as a better physician, better clinician, better husband, better father, and those things, how, how are they different? And then later we'll get on, on how to like, make them work? Yes, great question. Really, that's the my entire platform is about that question. So in medicine, we want to remove all risk and control everything. That works very well when you are a surgeon, obviously, or when you are taking someone's life and problems into your own hands. But that becomes limiting, uh, because you cannot be an expert on every aspect of life. And you cannot being weight to be in control of everything to take a step. That is why most physicians are completely stuck and paralyzed where they are. Uh, so I've learned to remove risk and control as much as I can in my office and in my patient care. But outside of that, I've learned to mitigate risk and still take it. I've learned that letting go of control sets me free. Uh, not having to do everything alone and on my own, which is how we do it in medicine, because I don't know if I'm going to be somewhere in the middle of the night with a patient who can't breathe or is bleeding and have no backup. That is necessary. But outside of medicine, there is something called leverage, where I can take someone else's time and expertise and use it to my advantage for a win-win, uh, where I can not do everything in my office because I'm the only one who cares as much or knows how to do it correctly, and have an office manager take away things that aren't good use of my time or not something I love to do, uh, where I can have partners. Zone of genius. You stay within your zone of genius. Yes. <laughs> your zone of happiness, your zone yeah. of purpose, your zone yes. of uh, saying no. In medicine, 
The answer is yes. Always say yes. That's how you get the research project. That's how you get the fellowship. That's how you get good rec letters of recommendation. Yes, yes, yes. But all those yeses suffocate you. And I've learned the power of no to find my hell yes. That is what I do now. I've learned to realize that every yes and no is a choice. And every time you say no, that gives you freedom to find a yes that aligns with you. I've learned that my money can make me money. And I don't just make more money by working harder and longer. That I need to work harder or I need to work hard make money, and have enough savings to put my money to work, to invest and make money from my money, or to make money from other people who work with me. Uh, all of those things are really interesting. I've learned powerfully that I am a doctor, but that is not all I am. I'm a husband. I'm a tennis player. I love being a father. I am a speaker. I have a platform. I lead my mastermind groups. I am a friend. I am a traveler. I don't even know all that I am. And those things that the more I feed them and grow them and love them, I love my life more and become a better doctor because I am not so depleted and empty and exhausted from my 200% in medicine. And before I had all these crises and pivots, I was 200% in medicine. I put everything behind my career, my degrees, my successful practice. Um, so because that is where I made money, that is where I was secure, that is what I knew. And that was the most well-defined role I played. I had to learn the role of a husband. Certainly, I you grow into the role of a dad. Uh, and these they don't mastermind teach us groups- that one. They definitely that? don't teach us that one really <laughs> well. You know, like your parents are- That your mom was dreaming and your father was paying for the dream and however the relationship was and you benefited from that, but they didn't give you the details of how, how to be a, a dad. Um, one of the things that we notice and, and the reason for us having these efforts is precisely there's so much burnout in our physicians these days and they don't understand these concepts that you're saying. It's very uh, difficult for them to understand and they don't see it as a worthy challenge to get out. It's just, you know, we talk about the golden handcuffs and how people are so frustrated and then they stay there and um, they, there's so much suicide in medicine uh, because of these not understanding alternatives and like you can design your physician life, you can, but to, to do that, you have to start with the mindset that, and that's, that's a lot of work there. That wasn't overnight for you. Um, and you can see that you have to grow. So you were in these groups and then from that group you grew and then there was another group which took you to the next level. It's like when you're going through through the through the belts in judo or, or karate or something, you go to the next level and the next level and uh, and you've been able to do that. So let's talk about a physician who's frustrated, you know, with the system. Let's talk about somebody who's there and saying, I cannot move like they are, they have the house they wanted, they have the family where they wanted, they have everything else seems to be like they're check the box of how life should be. They're in this job that really is not what they wanted. What would you tell them they should try to look for first to try to get the job or the life they want? It doesn't have to be a job. I would say uh, we live in a time of limitless information and opportunity. And the first thing I would do is dabble with no goal, with no expectation, but I would expose yourself to other voices, read other books, listen to all the podcasts. There's like 50 podcasts for physicians to expand your mindset out of medicine. Uh, watch YouTube channels, take a course, This is the whole basis of my platform and my newsletters. Uh, I would, that would be number one, is just to expose yourself to other voices and see who aligns, see who speaks to your soul, see who speaks to the future you that you want to be, see who emulates or lives where you want to be. And just like you would learn from a resident or fellow and how they did what they did and got where they, where they are now, 
you can do that with other people in and outside of medicine. But I can't uh, do that. That's too hard right now. I just have this job and, you know, I hate it here, but I cannot move. I can't, I can't do this. What, what would you tell them to something like somebody who's so overwhelmed that tells you that? I would say that you can either uh, complain or claim responsibility for your life. And just like you claim responsibility for all your choices, they are your choices. At any day, anybody who's a physician can say, this is not for me. I'm going to run a restaurant. I'm going to do learn something else. I'm going to change my specialty. I'm going to start being an expert witness. There's so many options. Uh, but what I have found is that It is not changing the system. It is not changing the boss. It is not changing your job that makes the change. We have to change. I learned that if I wanted to change my life, I must change my mind. And that means thinking a different way. That means making different decisions. That is accepting that I am going to have to change. And uh, that is not fun. It's not easy, but it is exciting. We changed when we became a intern, when we became a resident, when we started being called doctor and being responsible for other people's lives. We have changed many times over. And I think most of us are outstanding students that we are driven. We are excited by growth. To me, stagnation is torture. Uh, I think we need to carry all of those things that we are and believe we are in school and at work into our lives and be as disciplined and passionate about our dreams, about the parts of ourselves we want to grow and explore and discover as much as about medicine. We That's can't right. let medicine drown us and suffocate us. And the only way out of that is to expand the parts outside of medicine, to time block time for your kids, for exercise, for sex, for just playing and having fun because if you're having fun and you're playing and you're expanding those places you're going to be such a better doctor to give to your patients you're going to have so much more to overflow from your bucket so in my last change of uh of jobs um after that last change i i have to admit just simply i'm not a good employee you know i like to have the control of the patient's experience. I like to have the control of the employee's experience. I have, I like to have control of my experience. And then it's been interesting because some people will, will ask me, Oh, what happened? Or this or that, you know, like gossip about work and stuff. And it's not about blaming others. It's like, you have to take the responsibility. So why aren't, why am I not working at that place any longer? It's not because of them. It's because of me. Those are decisions that I made. I said yes to that position knowing many things that would have been uncomfortable because of whatever other excuses I had in my life uh, to justify my choice there, trying to make it work when it's not going to work um, for however long that was. There are some other people who thrive in that environment who really are doing well. So there are physicians who have trained, they, they had the same training, but they have different experiences, different views of life, different uh, priorities in life, right? And then if you're there in that job that you hate so much, really it's a choice that you are making to be there. And then you're justifying yourself every Absolutely. day and blaming somebody else about all these things that are happening, uh, that you say they're happening to you, but you should really just take advantage of it. You know what? Learn from that experience and then work. Because for example, in your case, when you were, you saw the writing on the wall, right? You were saying one to two patients a day. This is not going to last forever. You start looking, but maybe in your case, you should have looked quicker and earlier, right? And that way, maybe you wouldn't have been fired, but we don't know these things, right? At the time, but we can just not keep blaming the world for what's happening to us as physicians. It's time that we grow up in that way. We have to take responsibility and we have to take responsibility for all the changes that have happened in medicine, even though it wasn't us, it was maybe the generation before, but it's the same training to some extent. Um, so I liked a lot of things that you said here, a few things, you know, um, especially that yes, no, uh, it's a choice that we make and it has to be based on our principles on things that are important to us. So I think when we're 
making these changes in our mindset, we have to treat our lives and determine what's going to be important for us, what our contribution is going to be, our legacy, what you want to do, because you don't want to go and die like the young uh, other doctor that inspired you for that pivotal change that you had, right? And still you change, but then you change to a life that was so, you know, like, like involved in that way. And then you recognize and then you may change again. Um, so leveraging others, um, tell me how you've um, applied that to your current medicine life. Wow, so many ways. So as you know, I started my practice by myself alone with, you know, no patients. So when I started my practice, I had one employee, and I did payroll, I set up the answer, you know, the voicemail for the phone system, I ordered all the supplies, I, I did inventory, I did my QuickBooks every night for all my income and expenses, I basically was an entire practice. And over time, as we grew, and as I joined other people, and eventually formed my own group, I continued to do that. I ran every staff meeting. I trained the new staff. I trained the new physicians. I ran the office meeting. And after a certain period of time of learning from other people, uh, I had to relinquish some of that control and responsibility uh, by hiring an office manager. We're now on our fourth office manager. But now I can say this needs to be done. 20 years ago, I would have done it. I'm going to give this to the office manager to take care of. I hired a bookkeeper who now manages my real estate investments, my medical practice, my other businesses, and does all the income and expenses instead of me at 10 o'clock at night, five nights a month or something, me reconciling all of that. I leverage the people in my mastermind group who I get to know and see how they vent their, vet their syndications and can give me updates in person on a regular basis with my money, with my savings to make me money. So many different ways. Uh, I leverage my wife for her to do the things she loves to do in our family and for me to do what I love to do. And then I don't go shopping and, you know, I don't like shopping and she loves shopping. So that's a nice balance. I don't plan vacations. They, her and one of my daughters plans our vacations and I'm just happy to go away and not have to make any decisions and just enjoy and surrender. So Leverage is something I challenge myself with on a daily basis because my first mode is, okay, how can I learn all this and do it all myself? And I have to pull myself out of it. And uh, one of the books I recommend in our course is called Who Not How. And it really teaches you the freedom of instead of solving problems by what more can I learn and ex become an expert in and then do all myself, who do I need to accomplish this for me? It is transformational it really is yeah sometimes we want to do it all we want to have that control as i said you know like i'm not in clinically i want to control but at the same time if i'm going to be effective in the things that i want to do i'm going to say within the as you say the zone of happiness the zone of comfort the zone of the things that are going to allow you to use your capacity the greatest you know uh the the best that you can so that then you can be more productive without working more. Those are efficiencies that we have to learn these systems. And um, you mentioned some names there that, uh, you know, many of us know, but many of us might not know, right? You mentioned uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Tom Wilwright, and all these people. Tell us about your interactions during that period of time uh, when you learn about them. How was, how did you feel after talking to them, um, you know, those first times? So Robert Kiyosaki was a speaker. I didn't really have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. But I'll tell you, as I sat listening to his story of the rich dad, poor dad mentality and of leverage and having other people make you money and such, uh, I learned I was in the wrong tax quadrant, that I was paying the most taxes possible. And there were strategies and things you could do to pay less taxes. And there are accountants who will help you do that. And then there are accountants who will just do your taxes and not help you in any way. Work harder, work harder, work make harder, work harder, harder, make more money, pay more taxes, and you'll get whatever's left. So Robert Kiyosaki influenced me to see how I can push more of my income through the investor quadrant, uh, as opposed to through the self employed uh, quadrant or the employee quadrant. So that that was really an influence of just mindset, so much so. 
Same with Tom Wheelwright. You learn just about all these different things about having the benefit of having your own business, which I have to explain to every resident that interviews with us because so many people go to the comfort of a W-2 employee for a hospital health system or HMO or academia, uh, which is dramatically different from being an entrepreneur, running your own business and being an owner and having control of so many different wheels. So I, I, I learn more of what I need to teach from our experience with new people coming out and what they want and what they don't know. So uh, I'm a very big advocate of private practice. I'm a big advocate of having side gigs. I, I think one thing that, that was sort of a light bulb as you were speaking uh, that I think is really important that I would say to every suffering, unhappy, miserable physician and healthcare practitioner is you deserve to be happy. You deserve, it is a blessing when you wake up in the morning and you deserve to enjoy your day in your life. And no one is going to achieve that for you, but you, your wife's not going to do that. Your boss isn't going to do that. God is not going to accomplish that. Your pain and suffering and problems that you have now have a purpose to force you through discomfort to make changes that aren't easy. But that is the purpose of that pain. And it's only going to get worse till it's so bad, like I experienced time and time again, to do something that's uncomfortable and scary and make a change. And outside of medicine, if you make a mistake, you learn and you move on. And that's it. No one dies. Nothing is on your record. You make a mistake and you move on. And that is the real world outside of medicine. That is the breaking out of the medical mindset versus medical mindset. And uh, I give you all permission to dream of who you want to be in your perfect life, of who that kid was before you began this programming and incredible sacrifice to accomplish all that you have achieved and feed that person and make your dreams come true and devote as much discipline and intention and focus to those dreams as you do to working hard for your patients in your job. I'm sorry. I just have chills right now that just saying, I give you permission, you know, like, like people don't think like that, but can I, how can I do this? Like, yes, you can, because many do it and look around, look around you, even in the hospital that you're so miserable, why are those others so happy? Learn about them from them, ask them what they're doing. Maybe they just, you know, they're just people, like I said, who thrive in those systems and that's what they like, but maybe they have these other side gigs or other things that allow them to be free to come and present themselves in such a way that they're just happier physicians and, and you can do this. That's why we do this um, uh, effort because we know that there's options. There's so many that unfortunately have succumbed to their, um, you know, bad mindset, bad thoughts. But just learning that you have options that, yes, you can dream and you can achieve those dreams because others do it. Why can't you? If you are a physician, you can do these things as well. Absolutely. It's just amazing, um, you know, to me. And, and think about all these other people, like they're not physicians and they're living their dreams and they, they didn't uh, have all these grades and excellence that were expected from you when you did all those applications and all the tests and all the boards and the oral boards and the written boards and all this stuff. They didn't do any of that and they're doing things that they love to do. So why can't you allow yourself to do that? But you cannot give it to others for, to do it for you. You have to do it on your own. That's exactly. you have to. And, and this pain that you're suffering. Okay. Just, you know what? Just let's alleviate the pain. How do you alleviate the pain? Learn, establish the things that are important for you. And then, um, you know, we have to change that mindset. So. Wait, wait, I have another breakthrough that just from yes, what you said and just because of your spectacular platform that I think really that is the answer. Um, when we, we go through school and medicine and training in a programming structured, everyone does it the same. This is how you get in med school. This is how you get in residency. This is how you get a fellowship. Uh, I have to tell people I'm interviewing. I want you to be authentic and tell me the truth and not just tell me what you think. I want to hear because that's how you succeed in the medical mindset. I love 
designing your unique physician life because your, your life in contrast to the medical mindset is unique. And what will make you happy has nothing to do with what makes me happy or Dr. Diaz happy. And we can all have completely unique, spectacular, blessed, special lives that are not the same. And that is, a, that is the way it's supposed to be. We are all going to have different lives. What makes me happy and what gives me freedom and what I enjoy is different from other people. Uh, but just realize that, that you can take self-inventory and customize your path moving forward once you're out of training. Training is not customized. Training is standardized, robotic. And uh, that, that there's a comfort in that. And that's the way it is scaled and, con and continues for decades, really to a fault. But when you are free and you are out, you are free to make your life your dream and what you want it to be. And it can be different from everyone else's. You can pick and choose. That's what I do. I look at different people. We have all seen doctors who are incredibly busy experts who are miserable. We've also people who are very, very wealthy, who are addicts, you know, not successful in their marriage and not great parents. Not uh, having health, you get to not pick having and mental health, not having physical health. The money won't buy you those things, right? But you can use money as a tool. It's a great tool to have something that, that we are all wanting so that we can do all these things. But it's what's in your mind. You know, that's why we're talking so much about mindset, what makes you happy, having that control, having that ability, knowing that you can do it and choosing, choosing every time you say yes or no to something, um, what, what that decision is going to be. And it's not going to be easy every time. Like, was it easy, Brett, to finally say, you know, like sell those practices and get rid of these lives? That, that transition, you know what? We have a few minutes. Why don't we talk about how uneasy it was to break through that medical mindset for I'm you? I'm still doing it. I still do it every day. I still do it with every challenge. I still have to stop myself from trying to do it all and see who else I can help with. I still... Uh, talk about it with my accountability partners in my mastermind group about where I'm stuck. Oh, I don't want to do this with the platform. I've never done this before. Uh, and then the thing that changes the, the two things that help me move forward, even though I don't want to, or it's uncomfortable, or it's scary, is number one, uh, is what is on the other side exciting. Uh, there, we all have discomfort when we play a sport or do an adventure, but it's an exciting discomfort that we can get through when we're standing up there getting married, when our baby is being born. Those are all very scary, uncomfortable things, but what's on the other side is exciting enough to pull us through. Uh, when I have a moment, that pivotal moment of, oh my God, should I do this? Is it so much easier just doing more of the same thing, even if I'm not happy with it? Uh, I asked myself, what would the future me do? What would the person I'm not that I want to be do? And if the person that I want to be would do this, even though it's not me, I do it anyway. Because once you do it enough, it is you. That is how you transform and change. That is how you make those choices. If, if the person I want to be in the future me wouldn't, wouldn't do it anyway, then that's an answer too. And then this isn't the right choice and move on to the next thing. But uh, that helps me push through, wow, I wish I could be the person that would do this. Then I do it. Even if I know it's uncomfortable and I learn, I do it and learn and then move on. That's, that's just right. I'm telling you, there's, there's a saying in Spanish that I don't agree with now that I've changed my mindset. You know, it's just like, it's better to stay with something bad that you know, that's something good that you don't know. And that's like completely like the opposite. That's like the medical mindset. If you that is the there, medical it's like, mindset. It's yes. the medical mindset. You have to to really change and push through, and then become that that person that you really want to be. That is the mantra. What you just said that we don't agree with is the mantra causing burnout of people just doing more of the same and not changing anything. The and grass is greener on the other side, you know, like that, this thing staying there when, you know what, you don't know if you don't explore, you know, and you have to do these things with knowledge and with passion. So passion will move you, you get knowledge and then you get help of people. That's why we have these efforts, masterminds, you know, like we both run masterminds for a reason because they help you advance and 
And um, as physicians, we have been so many years training to be physicians that we missed on so much that coaching and training and, you know, and actually people who doesn't matter that they were physicians or not, this is how they advance in, in careers, just surrounding yourself with people who are thinking in these ways and opening your mind to new ideas. Let's tell everybody because, well, you know what? I really want it. I know it's a, a long time, but I just wanted to, because I was excited when you said that you went to study writing and now you do a newsletter which is a skill that you, you look for and you develop. Tell us a little bit about your newsletter, how often it comes, where people can find it. And then sure. after that, um, and tell us about how the newsletter has transformed you in any way, if it has. And then after that, tell us about your mastermind and how can people reach you? Okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, breaking out of the medical mindset uh, sends out a newsletter every Monday and Friday of each week. Monday is really me sharing a breakthrough, me sharing an epiphany, me sharing a strategy, me sharing just a different way to think in your day and giving you an action step to try. It's a free newsletter. Uh, and then on Fridays, I typically either share a question, I'll share a great podcast I listen to or a YouTube video or a podcast I'm on or um, I'll answer questions. People, there is a survey on breaking out of the medical mindset and we we are guided by feedback of what people want and need. So I, I'll answer a question. We have many healthcare professionals that are not even, uh, that are in addition to doctors, dentists, physical therapists, nurses, PAs, and uh, physicians. Although I'm speaking primarily as a physician because that's what I am. And, and everything is designed to help you change your thinking, help you take action and improve your life. Uh, there is also on the website a course where I go through different modules of setting your vision and giving you tools and tips to dream, which we haven't done probably in a very long time through our medical training. How you free up time, how you free up space to breathe, to think. Um, all the different medical mindsets of saying no, of being okay with making a mistake or failing, of, um, and then there's a whole module on leverage. There's a whole module on money and taxes and money mindset and and the tax quadrants and investing in real estate and different strategies. Uh, it really is me giving what I've learned in 30 years through 30 modules. Uh, this is all available by going to either breaking out of the medical mindset.com or faster, you can Google breaking out of the medical mindset, or you can go to www.boom, B O O M, mindset.com. And you can sign up for the free newsletter there very easily and check out the course. Oh, thank you for all that. Um, any final words for anybody who really um, still is? unsure of what the next steps should be about, you know, this mindset training. You must accept that you are more than a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, a PA, or what you do, and you deserve to have an amazing life. And it is time for all of us to help heal our healers and to set you free. You will be better at what you do, whether it's in real estate or it's in medicine or what have you, if you're happier and you're giving overflow because you're so full, because you love your life. I think it's uh, the greatest irony that there are so many people who aren't enjoying their life and they're supposed to help other people live better lives and, and, and lengthen their lives. Uh, you deserve, just like anyone else, you are human and you need to take care of yourself. And there's so many ways to do it. We have different podcasts and coaches and things on our website that you can check out as well. But uh, we are all blessed to be alive every day we wake up. My patients remind me of that every day. And uh, I think that blessing and that gift we should enjoy to the max. I want you to love your life. Thank you, Dr. Diaz, for allowing me to be here on this podcast. Thank you for being with us. This has been very enlightening. And I don't know, I think like we have to do like a, a retreat or something next year together to talk about mindset and help all these physicians. So I would love thank to. you very much. And um, 
there was that, you guys. We'll see you for the next time. Well, guys, that's it for today. Stay tuned for more of your Design Your Physician Life podcast, which was brought to you today by our Max Salary Mastermind, our personal and professional development program for physicians who want to learn about entrepreneurship. We will continue to bring you useful resources to develop your physician entrepreneur life like we did today with Dr. Brett Levine. You can reach him at his website, which is Breaking Out of the Medical Mindset. That is B-O-O-M-M-I-N-D-S-E-T dot com. Thank you for joining us. We hope you had a great time as we did. Stay in touch with us. Visit our website, maxcelerer.com. That is M-A-X-A-L-L-U-R-E. And don't forget to subscribe, like us, share. Share this podcast with your friends and families. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Please remember that design is not providing specific financial, medical, or career advice. Our only intent is to stimulate your appetite for growth by sharing our experience and those of our speakers, coaches, and guests. Your personal growth and success will be unique to your circumstances and your hard work. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the show and look forward to seeing you next week.